Hey everybody, this is Eli from Elfbait, and uh, thanks for coming back. I uh, want to do a real quick video today, kind of following up on the one that I did about quick and dirty monsters. Um, I figured an example um, was in order, and I'll try to make this quick and, and kind of succinct, which is not a strong point of mine. If you've been watching my videos, you know that the message can often be muddy, even though there is a message. Anyways... So, and then just to kind of recap, in the quick and dirty video talked about, you know, on quick and dirty monster video talked about monsters, um, to make monsters for your game, custom monsters for your game, um, th it doesn't require a lot of work. It, it, it's absolute BS um, that creating new monsters requires some astronomical amount of work uh, and, and it's hard. And I'm going to put through use. I'm going to try and use a couple of examples just so I can provide a, a good variety here. But um, in the history of my DMing, um, there's a couple of monsters that really struck a chord with players, and they were very simple builds. Um, and there's three actually that come to mind. So uh, the first of these was for a jungle crawl campaign that I had done, um, where there was a creature. I want. I wanted something large and monstrous, but I didn't want. Um, I didn't want to use a dinosaur, and I didn't want to use a dragon. I wanted something relatively mundane, and I wanted to have it fight like something big, but I wanted. No magic, low, you know, you know, just just really a, a pile of armor class and hit points. The party was relatively low level, but I wanted to give them a challenge, and I wanted to really challenge them. Um, now, just to, just a heads up, this was for an old three five game. And if you ever w really want to see when monsters were the hardest to build, look at three five. Anyways, so I come from a long history of running games, background in running games. Uh, and, and designing monsters, so, you know, for me, monsters have always just been something you come up with monsters, you put out ideas. Anyways, so, what I decided to do was I wanted to create a creature that would fill the role kind of of a dinosaur, but be wondrous in that it would be f clearly a fantasy creature. Um, using a giant something seemed a little bit like a cop-out, so it wasn't going to use a dire this or a dire that. Um... So what I came up with is uh, a creature that I called an Armadon. And an Armadon sounds like a dinosaur, yes, I know. But in this case, it was sort of a large ankylosaur armadillo hybrid critter. It was, um, and there was a little bit of sloth, giant, you know, ground sloth mixed in there. So thematically... The Armadon was a semi-bipedal creature, um, you know, basically went around on all fours most of the time, but could get up on its hind legs, uh, with large scraping claws on the front, on its front fingers, uh, for digging up uh, jungle roots and dragging fruits and leaves out of the trees. Um, I always think about. If I'm making a natural creature, or even with magical creatures, I always like to think about why they have features. It's the the science nerd in me that does this. Um, uh, it's also a, a leftover from all the sci-fi gaming I do, where I always feel a little bit more obligated to have some science. You have to have the sci to have the fi. Um, but so the Armadon had this. Um, it did not have a club tail, but it had a big, thick, meaty tail that it dragged beyond it, and it was covered in tough rhino hide type plates like an armadillo. So, statistically, what did I build this thing on? An ankylosaurus seemed a little overkill because ankylosauruses have bony plates and they're actually a much bigger monster. So, what I ended up doing is uh, finding the stats for. Um, a giant tree sloth, or not giant tree sloth, the giant ground sloth, prehistoric ground sloth, um, to start with. They have claws, so that was there. And then what I did is I looked at, uh, just I just added, I added um, armor class to it, and I gave it some more hit points 
to make it beefier and harder to hit. Now, increasing hit points and increasing armor class is tricky. To, is a tricky prospect whenever you're trying to create a monster, because you are actually creating a much tougher monster if you up both of those. But because this mo is going to be a monster to fight a party of I think six, uh, six players, in uh, in that particular edition, three five, where ungodly power in players. Uh, I wanted to make sure that it, it would last a bit. So it had, I took the tree sloth. I keep saying tree sloth. No, it's not the slow moving hanging tree sloth, the ground sloth. Um, took that, gave it a higher armor class. I think I used an armor class equivalent. I think I found the equivalent armor class for some other creature uh, that had, um, so I think I actually just used the armor class for a rhino. Um, using armor class for a rhino. Uh, claw attacks for the ground sloth. And then I gave it a tail sweep. And for the tail sweep, I believe I took the, the, the rules for the Ankylosaurus, but I reduced the damage because it doesn't have the bony club and uh, gave it, I think, a knockdown attack. So... That is it. I mean, that's that's really all all there was to it. I didn't get bogged down in calculating challenge rating. You know, challenge rate. I mean, you can calculate challenge rating if you want. I I will go on record now as saying I'm really not a fan of challenge rating for anything other than a vague idea of what the relative power of a monster is. So much of an encounter is built off of the why, when, where how of it you know those old writing you know you know when you're doing journalism the why the why where the when the how um that applies to encounters too and all of those factors are going to make a monster hit above or below its challenge rating so if you're doing it for home for just your game and you don't plan on publishing anything don't sweat challenge rating and i gotta you know a nod to to Matt Colville, uh, as he was on Twitter earlier, and he was talking about Critical Role, and uh, he kept using the abbreviation CR, and I completely thought he was talking about challenge rating, and to anybody who caught my comments, like, like you know who I am, but whatever, it's Elfbait on, on Twitter. Um, no, I don't like, I, I don't hate Critical Role. I thought he was talking about challenge rating, and oddly enough, his comments would have worked for challenge rating just as well as Critical role. Anyways, so, um, but yeah, so that that was the Armadon, and so the Armadon they they encountered it as a kind of a random encounter. It was a planned encounter, but they encountered it randomly in their travels to the jungle. Um, they were they happened to come across they happened to cross its path while it was foraging. Uh, they're grumpy, they're angry, they're territorial, so it didn't take kindly, and so yes, they ended up having to fight this big, tough tail sweepy clawing you know pile of hit points and armor so that was a pretty straightforward build you know the armadon played well i think they ended up not killing it um i think there was a druid in the party at the time and uh, if i recall correctly the druid kind of wanted to just fight to the point where they could either get it to retreat or or they could themselves go around it and so yeah i'm being a guy who never encourages players to just go for the kill you want to come up with a creative solution more power to you that's awesome so second example for a quick and dirty monster build is a creature i used in a game called necrolisk and a necrolisk is probably a really it, it, it's a really easy easy uh monster to build also but it plays as something you know the players remember it as one of the nastiest creatures I ever threw at him. And it really was, <clears throat> for all intents and purposes, a basilisk that lost its gaze attack and gained <clears throat> a nasty bite attack. So the necrolisk's bite, you know, statistically, it was identical to a basilisk. I think the only difference is I may have upped its dexterity because it didn't have a gaze attack to petrify its enemies, so it was actually more of a melee fighter, and I wanted to make sure that it could hit. Uh, because of the Necrolisk's big 
thing was its necrotic bite attack. And when I'm not talking about necrotic as in disease necrosis, this was a, a, a magical creature, like a basilisk is a magical creature, that when it bit you, it did necrotic, magical necrotic damage. In other words, it caused localized death in your tissue. Um, it didn't have a level drain, but it was this dying effect um, that, that was a magical de death effect. So the bite would do its bite damage, and then it would do X dice of additional damage when at the time at the time because it was it was uh 3.0 <coughs> or 3.5 yeah at the time i had to write out some description for what it did but nowadays in fifth edition you could just say bite attack is 1d6 or whatever a basilisk's bite is um plus uh save versus fortitude for or and you know suffer an additional 1d4 necrotic damage per turn until um you know you know the appropriate me measures you know remove curse or or some or you know or if you want to make it a little lighter weight until some sort of healing magic was used can't be bandaged flesh continues to just deteriorate um and, and until you know some sort of magical uh magical uh cure is, is is applied but that was it that was the necrolisk uh but that creature had the party hiding in uh lehman's tiny hut for ever i think the thing parked itself outside the door and they were afraid that it was going to be there when they got up in the morning because that thing only lasts x amount of time depending on you know the caster but yeah they uh they they were you know the thing had them terrified that they were gonna end up be you know because some one of them got bit and fortunately, there was a, you know, I think, you know, it's a, I think it's the same party, but, you know, from the Armadon, I think there was a druid in the party who was able to, to do some, some healy damage or a cleric or something. But yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a basilisk with a different attack. I described it slightly different. It was a little bit more nightmarish than the, the basilisk. It was longer and slinkier. It still had the same number of legs, um, kind of thinking back on it i mean it probably moved like randall from monsters inc <clears throat> um had big goggly eyes and uh i think i kind of just made it look more angler fishy kind of long needly teeth you know sort of you know can you really sink in there and get that necrosis going but uh yeah so it was statistically a basilisk it just had this necrotic bite instead of the petrifying gaze um <clears throat> now the third creature is uh, for the quick and dirty build. It's not, this is not uh, just a monster for a single encounter. This is actually a new humanoid type um, that I've used in, uh, I created in, when I was doing some OSR gaming uh, and remains one of my favorites. I've even made, I've even sculpted miniatures of them <coughs> um, back in the early days. So the miniatures are not as great as they could be. But um, so these are the Uhul. Now, the Uhul are a race of... The key idea behind the Uhul was taking owlbears and making them into a humanoid species. I love the look of an owl's face and the haunting nature of an owl. And so for this, this was for a kind of a really cold, wintry setting. And <clears throat> I didn't want to just use bugbears or orcs again. But I wanted to have the party encounter monsters that were that fought kind of at that level, but would really have some new style. I mean, they had the big owl eyes and described as the moon was hitting them, and they were kind of you know, and they were hooting and stuff as and guiding the the party along and sort of spooking them along. And so, but as stats go, for the most part, the Uhul are bugbears. Um, the base stats I started with it was a bugbear because the Uhul are about the same size. They're about eight feet tall, seven, eight feet tall, big, hairy bodies. You know, kind of like an owlbear, <clears throat> but proportioned from being giant, grizzly death machine to a humanoid race. Now, the Uhul uh, are... So that is the statistics for an Uhul. 
you know, they have claws, they have a beak attack, they have senses, you know, they have night vision, uh, they, uh, um, they, they are almost 100% statistically a bugbear. Now, in this case, the Uhul were dressed up with a bunch of stylistic elements that made them really different than bugbears, though there's no reason you couldn't run bugbears with the same personality <clears throat> and characteristics. The Uhul eat their prey. Like owls, <clears throat> they also then tend to regurgitate some of the elements of their prey. So the bones and the regurgitant elements of their prey, they then weave into very twisted magical totems and talismans and stuff. And so the Uhul are this evil sort of, I mean, whereas, yes, bugbears are traditionally depicted as evil, Uhul are not just savage evil, savage chaotic evil things. The Uhul are very much this I'm not only going to eat you but then I'm going to against I'm going to use you against your kin. That was part of their personality. They would tend to make cursed items uh that they would then try to inflict upon the kin folk of the people that they that, that they had consumed. <clears throat> uh their chosen prey was other humanoids. They didn't spend a lot of time hunting the other creatures of the woods, so the local villages had myths and folklore about them and uh, chants and sayings and the Uhul would leave horrible grisly gifts hanging from the trees at the edge of their civil of, of their settlements and just scare the crap out of them. <clears throat> but again, this is talking about quick and dirty monster creation. Remember, at the core of this <clears throat> is just really a bugbear. But after all of this change up, this bugbear is now something much much different than a bugbear. Uh in addition, <clears throat> the Uhul lived in ground burrows in tree th in, 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 in forests where they also shared their space with eye killers. Eye killer is a Native American myth, I believe, <clears throat> and has was depicted in the old Fiend Folio. Um, I used the eye killer in a slightly modified version because the eye killers, I believe they actually had a death gaze, which I thought was a little tough as a companion species for... A humanoid. I mean, it it could have been, but instead, I made them have like a paralytic gaze, uh, where they did the the Uhul would use them to as hunting creatures. <clears throat> so there was a symbiosis between them and this other stock monster that was also slightly modified. And in that case, it was just a matter of changing up the effect of the of the gaze attack. So and so to to to, to finish out the Uhul. The st you know statistically they're pretty much bugbears. What it came down to was writing up a couple of little special items, and uh, they had shamans, and they would have these like bone flutes that could cause fear, um, because they were actually totemic, weird spirit flutes that keyed in and and you know had this sort of spiritual effect. Um, <clears throat> you know they. Would, and then how I played them was a great, was actually a, a huge part of who they were as monsters in the game. Um, they were harassing the party. They were scaring them. They were following them in the dark. They were not letting them rest. This built up over time. So the Ahul, you know, become much more than bugbears. Again, you could play bugbears just like the Ahul, and that's another thing with quick and dirty monsters. Just as a side note, take a standard monster, don't even mess with its stats, and just make it play different. Give it something that normally wouldn't. Have your bugbears, oh, not, not your bugbears, say, maybe your orcs, maybe your orcs are all infernal. And so your orcs have devils backing them. Your orcs have devilish magic they're not a bunch of sloped over you know hunchbacked bestial thugs they are calculating lawful evil bastards who have magic items and stuff that they they can call on it's an easy it's an easy twist anyways so this video is actually turning out to be running about 
almost as long as one of my normal videos, but I wanted to give some good examples. So, kind of recap, we had the Armadon, who was a mishmash of a ground sloth, a giant ground sloth, uh, a Ankylosaurus, and a rhino um, to present a fighty monster that was going to be a challenge for a lower level party. Um, you know, around three or four, th third or fourth level. Um, then there was the Necrolisk, which is really just a special effect swap out um, and attack change for a standard monster, the Basilisk, changing from a gaze-based attack to a melee-based attack with a new special effect. So for that one, the key thing there is to make sure that you compensate for the fact that this, this creature has to hit to get that effect in. So upping its combat, it's, it's to hit bonuses and um, making sure that it has uh, maybe a, a boost in it in, in a, to its armor class dexterity wise because it's going to have to wade in. Unlike a basilisk which can just stand back and look at you, the necrolisk has to get, get in and fight. And then with the Uhul, which are statistically almost 100% bugbear, but they have a lot of window dressing added on and a lot of style applied to their play. You could almost consider the Uhul a reskinned bugbear. They are a bugbear wearing an owlbear skin and acting like a bunch of evil bastards. And I mean really evil. Not 